I have discussed the shear sense indicators and typically from mineral fish how to have an idea of high shear strain, low shear strain and sometimes if we are getting a parallelogram shaped mica fish how to obtain the shear strain. Then what is my expectation if there is any shear zone where poisonous flow and shear etc has happened has been discussed. So the mineral fish part is over. Now I am going to look at the SNC fabric and whether we can comment something on the shear strain. I take a shear zone with S and C plane. This is the primary shear C plane and this S geometry, sigmoid geometry of the foliation plane can be called as the S plane. It has been observed and also can be theoretically be proved that the angle between S and C varies between 45 degree. Now if I consider this as a shear zone devoid of secondary shearing, no C dash, no C double dash shearing are acting, in other words no synthetic and no antithetic shearing are acting in this zone. Then suppose I raise a question that along this line PQ how the shear strain varies. PQ is a line which is across the shear zone and if I had drawn a line like this that would indicate a line along the shear zone. First we try to understand what will be the shear strain variation across the shear zone. So I am going to construct a graph. I can plot here P and I can plot here Q. This distance may be few centimeters is plotted over here and in this side I will be plotting the angular shear strain or the rotational shear strain. Now we need to understand about the genesis of this S fabric also. There are various views. One view is that these S fabric are pre-existing foliation which are straight if undeformed and when shearing happens these straight foliations become sigmoid in geometry. Now looking in the shear zone it is not possible to tell what was the initial orientation of the S plane. If only this much is the information, only this much that there is C plane and S plane and not looking at outside shear zone or maybe there is poor exposure. It is not possible to comment that the S plane was initially oriented like this or like that and from there a ductile shearing has produced this sigmoid geometry. So the initial orientation is not known. Commonly not known, but there can be some cases where we may be able to understand what is the orientation of the S plane. Suppose outside the shear zone we are getting this kind of orientation of unsheared foliation plane, then through field work we may be able to comment that these foliations inside has become this sigmoid geometry. In that case we say this is the initial orientation. So this is one of the views that they are the pre-existing foliation planes that during shearing attains a sigmoid geometry. There is a second view. The second view is that within a future shear zone, future shear zone means I am going to put half arrows here and then the shearing will act. There may be randomly oriented mineral grains, let us take micas and if you apply a shear, these minerals take an overall orientation like this defining the S geometry. If that is the case then finding out shear strain as per what I am going to speak will may not be correct. So what I am going to talk right now will be our case 1 that there are pre-existing foliation planes if that can be established then for sure we can plot or give some idea about the shear strain variation. Okay. Now suppose it is the case that in the field I have identified the initial orientation of the foliation outside the shear zone and the final orientation then I can take several points on the S plane and I can draw small tangents on each of these points. 
Now, what was the orientation of these tangents before the deformation? The orientation was, now I am redrawing because it is getting clumsy. Say this is the geometry. Take this point. This point was here before deformation, slow deformation, very slow rate, millimeter per year, so laminar flow has happened. So, here is a tiny tangent and here the initial orientation position of the point if I draw a tangent that basically merges with the initial position of the marker. So, what is the angle between them I can find out like I can extend this line and find let us say this is my angle psi 1. Like this at point to point if I keep on finding out the shear strain we can find that approximately in the middle of the shear zone approximately here this is the place of low amount of shy and these the boundaries of the shear zones are the places where we have a high amount of shy. So therefore the plot will be something like this from P point over here from one of the boundaries of the shear zone the shear strain falls it may not be zero and then again it goes up. The exact nature of this curve can be worked out it may be straight line or curve which we can check. I can draw a sigmoid geometry here or take a real S fabric from the field by taking photograph and on the photograph we can keep on drawing tangents and then exactly plot and see how the shear strain varies in the shear zone. Now in the same shear zone if I go few kilometers ahead I may find the S fabric is having a little bit different geometry. This sigmoid and that sigmoid are not exactly of same geometry. So here if we plot psi versus the distance PQ distance exactly same curve will not come some variation in curve will come but we understand that whatever be the S geometry it is broadly speaking at the boundary it is having a high shear strain and falls and goes up. And in, in case of psi if I take tan psi another parameter of the shear strain then also such pattern will be found there is a decreasing and then the increasing pattern. I am not going to get zero shear strain in the middle because you can see at no position these tangents are parallel to this orientation of the line. So this is an overall idea what we understand about the from the SC fabric and the shear zone. Now having said this you can understand or you can now compare with a Poissoli flow pattern through a horizontal channel like this as I have drawn and a typical shear zone what is more found in structural geology. The Poissoli flow is not st has still not entered the structural geology textbook but in some of the advanced uh, plate tectonics books numerical models there they have started referring the Poissoli flow. So that is the one and the SC fabric is described in almost all the structural geological textbooks. So this is a textbook example of shear zone this is the Poissoli flow and the associated shear. Suppose I call this as P and Q and here also I say P and Q then you can look at my previous lecture and you will find that from this point to this point the shear strain decreases to 0 because the tiny tangent here is parallel to that line. So for the Poissoli flow pattern something like this will be produced and this is typically the D point the middle of the shear zone D point is the middle of the shear zone and what about the SC fabric here you see the geometry is certainly not parabolic. So the tangents and the angles at each of these points and here the angle will be different. So I am expecting a curve something like this that the shear strain falls and goes up but this yellow curve and this curve are not going to superpose they are not congruent to each other. So what we find is that in case of a Poissoli flow shear strain at the margin is highest and in the middle it is lowest. In case of SC fabric and the classical shear zone described by so many persons in structural geology textbooks and research paper shear strain is maximum at the boundaries and the middle it is minimum. Then what is the difference in case of an ideal Poissoli flow the shear strain in the middle is equal to 0 so that curve touches the x axis whereas here there is no such point where I can draw a tangent which is 
parallel to that line. So in that case, we may not find a point of zero shear strain. So the take home information from here is that in the middle of the shear zone, there should be minimum shear strain and at the margins, there should be maximum shear strain. Let me write that. So what I said right now is that At the margins of the shear zone, the shear strain is maximum and at the center it is. Therefore, suppose study with mineral fish or preferably with quartzofelspathic mineral in the KVN analysis, kinematic vorticity number. You find such a pattern in the shear zone, what I have written here, it will not guarantee whether Poissoli flow has happened or whether a classical shear zone what we have drawn with SC fabric has happened. You cannot say based on this information that there is a Poissoli flow because even if there is no Poissoli flow, a pure Kuwait flow, then also the same pattern will be found. Now one more interesting thing should be described in certain books these lines are not called the margins of the shear zone. In fact, that has been called as the center of the shear zone. So if I call this margin, let us say AB line and here it is the PQ line, this is the CD line, this is the RS line, then I can say in some classic textbooks, Example, the book by Ramsey, these lines A, B, C, D, P, Q, R, S, etc. are considered as the center of shear zone and in such research papers or books, they consider this as the margin of shear zone. So if we define the center of shear zone and the margin of shear zone in just opposite to what I was talking, then this statement has to be changed. In that case, at the margins of the shear zone, shear strain is minimum and at the center it is maximum. To give an example, let us say this is a shear zone, some foliation is showing this kind of step pattern. Then in Ramsey's book, I think you will find that this is the margin of the shear zone. Why they say as if at the margin the shear strain is minimum and where do they say this is the center of the shear zone? Such books will say this is the center of the shear zone where the shear strain is maximum. So I hope it is understood there are two groups of geologists who will define the center and margin of shear zone in two different ways. So once we do our own research or write some book or we are talking in any conference, we should clearly point out which one is the margin and which one is the center and maybe we can give references that our definition of margin and center is as per that author that will avoid ambiguity. To analyze deformation in structural geology, we sometimes use markers which can be straight lines or which can be tiny circles and we see progressively how this circle is deforming, how those lines are deforming. In case we use circle in the ductile shear zone studies, suppose this is our shear zone of consideration and the bottom boundary is static and the top boundary moves. Initially I think of a circle. This circle may not be a real object. We are thinking in the theoretical study how this circle will look like with, with due deformation. So in case of a coet flow, this circle will become an ellipse or if I had drawn a straight line, it will become an elongated straight line. So as we see here that the circle deforms to an ellipse, a regular geometric shape altering to another regular geometric shape and all the material lines have moved in parallel direction. 
so we can call such deformation simple shear as a homogeneous deformation and if we increase more shear it will become an ellipse of higher ellipticity or higher aspect ratio these words ellipticity and aspect ratio i have already discussed in my lecture now in the same shear zone instead of a single big circle the modeler might think of several circles of equal radius and then apply the shear so in this case if it's newtonian viscous rheology we can understand that each of these circles will become ellipses so if we put a question here suppose we find out how the aspect ratio or the ellipticity of the big circle in this case keeps changing with its inclination this inclination alpha also was defined in my previous lecture and the same thing is done for each of these circles do they maintain same pattern do they show parallel lines in the r versus alpha plot or any other pattern is found it will be worth studying i will be requesting the students to do this and how to do we know in case of a coet flow this straight line alters to that straight line and its velocity profile you can easily work out this is a case where the del p del z is equal to 0 u2 equal to 0 and only u1 is working so we can find the equation of this line and call it as the velocity profile now apply the same process same principle movement etc on each points of a circle we can take the equation of circle also because this is our the uz axis this is our y axis if the center is 0 0 then the equation of the circle i can take as x square plus y square equal to square of radius and how much is the radius half the thickness of the shear zone the total thickness was 2y0 unit so this is y0 unit so this is y0 square that is the equation of the circle now with this how the circle will become an ellipse this ellipse equation e1 can be deduced e2 can also be deduced as e1 and e2 can be deduced so therefore the r and alpha relationship also can be worked out for different angles of alpha now come to this point here i can think say this is the x axis the uz and i have taken three circles of equal radius so therefore this thickness is y0 unit because the total shear zone thickness we are always considering as 2 y0 unit so the one third of it will be y0 by 3 unit therefore the radius of each circle will be y0 divided by 6 is the radius of small circle small circular markers and now we know the velocity profile here how much is the movement we can apply that movement on each of these points and work out the small ellipses these three will become these three ellipses and then we can work out the r versus alpha relation it will be interesting to do one such strain analysis what was done for a simple shear zone when can also be done in case of a poissouli flow this is a marker and here is the parabolic profile flow happening from left to the right hand side direction i can think of one circle here and i want to see how this circle keeps on evolving in with time as a poissouli flow happens in this case a circle will not be deformed to an ellipse although it's a simple shear deformation with rigid boundaries and the flow is happening all material points moving in same direction parallel to each other nevertheless this circle will not become will not become an ellipse since a regular geometric object alters to some irregular geometric shape in this case we can call this as a non homogeneous deformation this non homogeneous can also be called as 
inhomogeneous deformation so what we have understood so far in case of a coet flow which is a simple shear is a homogeneous deformation whereas a poissouli flow purely poissouli flow a kind of simple shear is a non homogeneous deformation so in this case since the geometry will not be elliptical a regular geometric shape defining the aspect ratio for an irregular body may be problematic in general i can say if this is an irregular object although this circle will not look like this but i have drawn an irregular object one way crude way approximate way of defining the aspect ratio is that find out the longest line within it and perpendicular to that find out the longest line so if this is a length that is b length a divided by b can represent r in a very crude sense this a divided by b by the way does not indicate the whole geometry of the marker nevertheless a by b can be done so if you do that in that case you can be able to plot the r versus alpha we know for this green line this parabolic geometry the velocity profile the equation we know and at one instant that is also the displacement profile so basically we know each of these green points move to how much distance we can apply that on each points on the circle how the profile will look like any point on the circle can also be represented in a parametric representation form this yellow circle we can write again as x square plus y square equal to a square but this is by the way the uz axis so i can write this basically as uz square plus y square is equal to a square okay so if that is the case here x this term also needs a change suitable change for the x direction now there can be parametric form i can write uz is equal to a cos theta and y equal to a sin theta which means that any point lying on the circle has a coordinate a cos theta a sin theta now we know how much is the displacement of each of these points we can easily come out with the irregular geometric shape and how it changes with time so it will be interesting no one has done but it will be quite interesting to generate such geometries and see and speculate what can be expected in case of a poissouli flow now the thing is if the marker is not so big imagine a kilometer scale poissouli flow shear zone is there and there are small markers so in that case this is the velocity profile and i will be drawing smaller circles as i told you it will be from top to the bottom now how this smaller circle what would be the geometry produced because of this poissouli flow can be worked out r versus alpha can be plotted so i have talked about a coet flow i have talked about a poissouli flow and here is the our base for the combined poissouli and coet flow there also we can apply the same principle imagine the flow is happening from bottom towards top and this is the shearing in that case as i have already described this is the velocity profile so i can think of a big circle a single marker and see how it deforms with time or if required we can take smaller circles as markers and keep tracking their deformation how the aspect ratio changes here also it will be an inhomogeneous deformation this green circle will not be an ellipse due to this kind of non homogeneous deformation as you see the straight line the marker has become a parabolic profile so these will be some of the interesting lines of direction in which the shear zones can be studied in great detail we have seen so far the poissouli flow and the coet flow and their combinations for a single lithology and the derivation has been made for the velocity profile and the displacement profile shear senses how they will be has been talked about imagine now the situation of two materials 1 and 2 and their contact is parallel to the boundary material 1 has a viscosity mu 1 material 2 has a viscosity mu 2 so we are basically talking about now the simple shearing of the layered rocks if a shear is is given at the top boundary and the keep the bottom boundary static then instead of a completely straight line as the velocity profile the profile will have this kind of geometry the profile within 1 and the profile within 2 can have the angle phi 
and this phi will be a function of the viscosity ratio between the layer 1 mu 1 and that of layer 2 mu 2. So, I write phi is equal to function of mu 1 divided by mu 2 and naturally if mu 1 is equal to mu 2 that means mu 1 to by mu 2 ratio is equal to 1 then this phi angle is expected to be 180 degree that means these two layers are behaving like a single material and the straight line alters or shears to another straight line in terms of velocity profile and also in terms of displacement profile. How is that? Imagine a situation that there is a layer 1 and there is a layer 2 and their contact is parallel to the boundary. This layer has viscosity mu 1 that has mu 2. P1 and P2 are the different pressures created so that this is high pressure zone, this is a low pressure zone, P2 more than P1. So, fluid flows here and the boundary is a static. Ideally, it should produce a parabolic profile if it is a single lithology, but now that there are two lithological types, so this straight line will not be a smooth parabola in that case. What would be the geometry? Now, other than the layer case, two more cases are worth considering and we might be doing work in future. Imagine there are two lithologies A and B having different viscosities and you have applied a simple shear at the top, the bottom boundary is static or the boundary between A and B is having an angle, initial angle. In that case, how this boundary behaves with time will be interesting to study.